You're listening to The Virtuous Mind, a podcast from Providence Christian College that discusses all facets of the human experience and the liberal arts from a biblical worldview. I'm your host, Dr. David E. Alexander. Where do you rank friendship in terms of importance? Interestingly, the ancients and medievals saw friendship as one of, if not the most, important relationship we can have. The fact that many of us today do not see things that way, or at least do not live that way, may suggest that we have lost sight of the true nature of friendship. Perhaps that at least partially explains the extreme loneliness many in the West experience. It may be that the kind of friendship advocated by many of the greatest minds in history is simply absent today. That is, it may be that most of us simply do not have any real friends. Furthermore, and even more alarming, is the fact that many Christians do not think of their relationship with God as a type of friendship. It stands to reason that if our conception of friendship has diminished, then our understanding of being friends with God would diminish as well. And yet the greatest relationship a human can have is friendship with God. In this episode, I chat with Dr. John Cunningham, recently retired professor of humanities at Providence Christian College. Regularly lauded as one of the best lecturers around, Dr. Cunningham helps us navigate ancient, medieval, and modern literature on the topic of friendship, revealing its incredible value and its near absence from contemporary life. Well, John, welcome. So good to see you. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. The topic for today is friendship. What got you interested in friendship? You know, I think as I read ancient sources, I realized how important this issue was for them. And by contrast, how different it is now. Not that the friendship is not important to modern people. It is. But I tend to think that C.S. Lewis is right when he says we mean different things by friendship now. Mm. Like he thinks that we generally mean companionship, somebody to do something fun with, someone to go to a game with, someone to have cookouts with. But the way the ancients talk about it was very different. And I think there's some ironies involved in this that are very interesting to me. For instance, one of them is that the ancients took it so much more seriously than modern people do. But I think friendship has a lot more influence on us now than it used to. Most of human history, you grew up in one little community you were raised by the same people as you went through your crazy periods. You know, there were people that knew you around. So it was the community that really held you through life. But for most of us now, we get out of college and move someplace for a job, move someplace else for another job. And so the people around us that are forming us, that are our deepest community, are friends more than family Mm -hmm. often. There's a paradox or an irony there or something where it's less important in modern culture. We take it a little less seriously, but it's having a greater effect than it used to on our lives, a disproportionate effect. So I I think it matters. It sounds like one way of thinking about this is that the quantity of our friendships has maybe increased in Mm -hmm. the modern period. And nevertheless, maybe the quality of them has decreased over time. And perhaps that's a function of our lack of reflection, our lack of intentionality, maybe investing in those relationships. Is that sort of getting at this kind of shift that you've noticed? Yeah, I I think so. But Aristotle, one of the fountainheads of thought in Western culture on friendship, said you probably won't have more than a handful of friends in your life. And you most certainly can't have more than one or two at a time. It just takes so much time for him. And that is not how most of us think of friends. 
the idea that I can only have a couple of them because those sorts of relationships are going to be time-consuming, they're going to require a great deal of investment from both parties, does suggest maybe the nature of the relationship looks very different today than it does from the ancient medieval time. So what are some of those themes, those elements from the ancient medieval period of friendship that maybe we're not practicing or we're not cultivating today. Yeah. You know, I do think it's just very different. I was just thinking of something that would seem odd to us today would be the idea that we would test people for a period of time before we would think of them as a friend. Mm -hmm. Elred of Raveau, who wrote a book on spiritual friendship, gave a lot of advice about how to test people because for him, once you admit someone as a friend, it's pretty much permanent. There's only one or two things that can end a friendship on his mind. For him, the betrayal of a secret, of a confidence, might end a relationship. You just can't get back from that in most cases. Or he thought if one person's character completely fell apart, mm -hmm. it just might not work anymore. But other than that, this is a fairly permanent commitment. So you're going to test it and it's going to take a big part of your life. And, you know, we just tend to see who do we like in a small group at church and let's ask them over for a barbecue. And I don't think we're conditioned to think deeply about the topic. Friendships come when the rest of our lives are put together, when we've got our career in place, when we're married. Then as icing, not as a necessity, but as icing on the cake, we want to have a few friends around. I think Aristotle, Cicero, Ambrose, Augustine, Elred, Aquinas, some of the big names in Western thought, thought about it very differently. What do you see as some of the characteristics of this type of relationship that they would have emphasized that maybe we don't emphasize? And, you know, as you're talking, I'm almost getting concerned that maybe it could be that if I examine my own life, I would actually discover that I don't have any relationships that resemble the kind of relationship that those people called friendships. Yeah, I think one of the most influential views on this was Aristotle. Is he said there were three types of friendship. And I think that we don't make those distinctions. So we probably call lots of folks friends that are in the first two of his types. But this kind that I've been alluding to, this highest kind, ones that he would call friendships of virtue, mm. uh, they're hard words that erte to translate, or uh, friendships of beauty and excellence friendships that are perfected. Those are the ones he's talking about. They're on this whole other level. You're spending your days together and they are ones where like two bodies and one soul. Mm. And they're very um, almost romanticized visions. The idea that you're really sharing your soul. The Irish have a beautiful concept of this in their spirituality of an anamkara, a soul friend. Um, someone who you share everything with. And it is held in confidence by someone who is for you. There's not shame in that relationship mm. because this is a, a soul friend who's helping you through the inevitable struggles that we all have, the things that you would never share, but you do share with this spiritual kind of friendship. Wow. That sounds incredibly attractive. It does, doesn't it? Walk us through those three different sorts of friendship that yeah. Aristotle mentions. You you talked about the highest kind, maybe the ideal. Yeah. What are the other two that maybe we're more familiar with today? Yeah, yeah. Aristotle, one of his most significant books, a, a book you're well familiar with, The Nicomachean Ethics, that he wrote for his son, about a third of his book on ethics is on friendship. And that's where we get the three types of friendship. So the first type that he mentions are friendships of utility. These are friendships that are useful to us. Usually when I'm explaining this type of friendship to my students, there's a misunderstanding that comes right away. It's that this is a cold calculating using of people. But that's not what he means. He doesn't see this as a bad yeah. or selfish. Yeah. He sees it as necessary. It is good to have useful friends in our lives. Um, it's better to get along and joke with your work colleagues than not. It's a good thing, but it's the lowest form of friendship. He thinks it's good, but it's just not as good as the other two. Again, C.S. Lewis, who wrote just a great book on the four loves and, and considers friendship there, Philia, gets it right. He says, you don't disparage silver by saying it's not as good as gold. It's still good. These, these lower kinds of friendship, they're just not that thing that you and I both found as so attractive of, ah, oh, I would like a friendship like that. Mm. So the second level then are friendships of pleasure. These are friends that are in your life because they're fun. Maybe these are funny people, smart people that are interesting at parties, good-looking people like you and me. <laughs> uh, 
they're people that you hang out with because you like it. Like friendships of utility, what we want is what we're getting out of it. So if we don't get that anymore, the friendship will end. If the beautiful person that we're friends with, sorry to be morose here, but is in a disfiguring car wreck and they're not beautiful anymore, then if that's what it's really based on, we're not getting that anymore. The funny person that's in our life because they're a blast and so amusing and they go through a period of depression and it's years and they're not funny anymore. That friendship probably won't last because it is not about the person that is our friend. It is about what we're getting from it. It's really Really, it's self-referential. It's about ourselves, ultimately. The highest kinds of friendship, and this is his big distinction there, are no longer based on what we're getting from it, but it's based on the other person. There is a valuing of the person, not the pleasure we get from them, not the usefulness we get from them. He thinks you still get pleasure and usefulness from the highest kinds of friends, right. and we do. But if we didn't, that's not what it's about. He thinks, this is why it's in an ethics book, they're the kind of friendship that makes you a better person. This is where he's aligning with biblical insights that everything that matters in life, you can't really do alone. Western culture, we tend to think of individualism. That This is a very different view. It's like, yeah, you're not going to probably make it all by yourself and flourish. If you want to flourish, it takes these deep connections. I think it's partly why we see, you know, there's been so many books written probably since the 70s on the friendless American male, on the increase of loneliness in our society. I mm. think we're so mobile. Again, we try to stitch friendships on top of career moves, moving to another town, get all that done first. And if there's any time, energy, or opportunity, left over than friendships. But then we're disfigured by that because I think we're designed in the image of a Trinitarian God who is an eternal relationship, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And we're made in the image of that God mm. who is relational in that way. And we just don't flourish if we can't find this deeper kind of thing that I think, you know, is so on the face of it, wonderfully attractive. It'd be difficult to miss, right, the kind of loneliness epidemic, right, people mm -hmm. are calling it, especially perhaps in men. I've wondered if part of it is if our culture seems to have sort of reduced love to romantic love. Mm -hmm. Really, the problem here is this kind of reduction of all loves to a romantic, sexualized kind of love, where the ancients and the medievals didn't suffer from that kind of reductionism, and they could envision this deep, intimate kind of love between men or between women that resembles mm -hmm. this other kind of love, perhaps in some ways, but in many cases sounds even deeper. There's something in our culture, and I think it may have happened since romanticism, you know, hard to define, but let's just call it the 19th century, that elevated the passion of romantic love as the great good. And so that everything else pales by comparison. But when you do read these ancient ones, even when you read someone like C.S. Lewis, who's not that long ago, he's like, friendship is much more powerful. Mm, yeah. Um, romantic loves, even within marriage, you know, the, the passion and romance waxes and wanes, you know, it's the nature of it. It's the nature of Eros to inflame and fade. But friendships can become really deep, really important to people. So yeah, I think there's been something shift in our culture. Braveau, who wrote this book on spiritual friendship, some folks have wanted to see that him as describing homosexual relationships. I don't think there's any evidence for it because it's so intimate, so intense, right. so committed. But you know, when we think biblically again, then you think of Jonathan and David, and there's some kind of intimacy there that is very deep where they start to be compared as it's more than the love of a woman. Yeah. I think we all get uncomfortable using intimate language with students. I'm, I'm often trying to get especially guys to be able to use words and get more comfortable with that because they'll joke around and say, love you and I love you, man. But unless somebody's got four beers in them, you don't hear that kind of language. Mm -hmm. um, it's unusual. Now in other cultures, I spent, you know, I don't know, a summer in Africa, it's very common for men to walk arm in arm, hold hands, kiss in many cultures in the world, kiss on the lips and greeting. We just don't have that worry as deeply as we do somehow in our culture. Yeah. But that probably yeah. really has impeded male friendships. As my wife and I have lived with students now for a number of years, we've noticed an interesting phenomena. We'll bring various rooms into our home for a meal and just try to get to know them and them get to know us a little bit and start cultivating a deeper relationship with these students. And again, especially with young men, 
We'll start asking them questions about their life, their background, try to understand who they are from a variety of different perspectives. And as we're engaged in these conversations with these rooms of young men, we'll ask the rest of the room, did you know that about your roommate? And mm. almost to a person, they'll say no. And so their relationship with their roommates, you know, some of it's these relationships, these friendships of utility, friendships of pleasure, but they don't go beyond that. Mm -hmm. So then we probe a little more deeply and ask the students, do you have people in your life with whom you have these deeper relationships, peers? And many of them will say no. So my wife and I have thought that a lot of people, a lot of young people especially, don't even know how. Yeah. Don't even oh, know yeah. how to pursue this, how to develop yeah. and grow these kinds of relationships. What can we yeah. learn from the ancients, medievals, and, and some contemporaries on how to pursue this? We don't come out of the womb knowing how to do relationships. Mm. We have to be taught. We have to be mentored. We have to be formed. But I don't think people know how to do it. But there's a deep hunger. I, I wonder if you've seen this too. They want it. Yeah. They want to connect. Do you see that as I well? I do. Yeah. I do. You know, as, as you were talking, I was thinking about this. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Guys will get together and almost pretend towards intimacy, mm -hmm. um, but never actually reach it, not share the deepest, darkest things going on inside them in their lives with others, even if it's just one other, maybe no one on earth knows yeah. what's going on. And obviously, I think all of us would see that as a, a problem, right? As unhealthy. There is a place that just popped in my head as you were talking where this does happen. And it's Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. Absolutely. So if you've ever been to an AA, NA, any of those blank anonymous meetings, I have been to them and I have often wept inside those meetings, hearing the stories, not wept because of the content of the story, but wept because there was this space, this place where people could share the worst things about them and be loved. Yeah and be embraced and accepted. And I've thought, this is the church. And of course, a lot of Alcoholics Anonymous meetings take place at churches. AA is saturated in a kind of biblical mm -hmm. Christian understanding of humans. And so I don't know if you want I to comment on so that. so true. And, you know, the 12 step, it, it's, it's built into it. Absolute honesty, rigorous honesty in an absolutely confidential environment and absolute protection of your reputation outside of the group. That does sound like the church, doesn't it? Oh, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's. And it it's, sounds like good theology to say we're all broken. We're all beggars mm. trying to show each other where to find some food. I think that brings us back to the types of friendship because there really is a problem with Aristotle. Aristotle doesn't talk about Christian friendship. And that's why I love El Red of Revo. And his book is very readable. It's called Spiritual Friendship. I would highly recommend it to our listeners. The opening of that book is just beautiful. It says, Here we are, you and I and a third, I hope, in our presence, mm. Christ. And that's something Aristotle, with all his common grace, and Cicero, one of my heroes, who updated it into sort of a Hellenistic Roman context out of classical Greece, couldn't do because they didn't have this third person in the friendship. There have been a number of people, C.S. Lewis again, Jonathan Edwards, who have talked about the ideal number for friendship is not two. We bring a lot as Christians that allow us to get where these things that you're seeing in 12-step groups, as Christians, we have resources that others don't have. Let's say you and I are able to develop this kind of intimate friendship, and we do so without Christ. There's a danger here, and the danger may be a kind of idolatry. Yes. And mm. where the relationship itself becomes the most meaningful, significant yep. thing in my life. And so if it falls apart, I fall apart. Mm -hmm. My life is built on that kind of instability. Yeah. Because even though I love Aristotle and all these guys and their valuing of stability, they can't get the kind of stability that you can have in a relationship he with can't God. can't bear the weight. It's not possible. To use an analogy, boy, I'm on C.S. Lewis today, apparently, but you know he has a great analogy about this. Ultimately, it can't just be a face-to-face -face relationship. It has to be shoulder to shoulder, yeah. meaning you're facing together a higher purpose. And this is, you know, just imagine 10th grade dating relationship where it's so intensely into each other. There's nothing else. They don't talk to any of their friends anymore. They sit by themselves at lunch. You 
know that relationship's going to implode because no relationship can bear that weight. The difficulties we have in marriage is it's the only long-term stable relationship we have left in our culture with all the moving around right. and inability. We work so much and all this to develop other relationships, but they can't bear that weight. So the failures of all relationships, the disappointments, the loneliness, it ends up eating up that relationship, destroys it because we don't have these ones that are bigger than just the face-to-face -face if we don't have Christ in it and purpose. Now, I do think for believers, we can have higher missional things we care about. God has to be the thing that links the relationship together. It goes through God. Well, when it goes through Christ, when my relationship, when my love for my wife, my love for my children, my love for my friend goes through Jesus, there's a kind of cleansing that occurs. There's a kind of acceptance, a kind of forgiveness. Again, there's a freedom yeah. there. I do not have to look to them for my ultimate purpose, my ultimate significance and value. We're both looking at Jesus for yeah. that. This brings us, I think, to the last topic I really mm -hmm. wanted to discuss with you about friendship, and that's friendship with God. Christ mentions, right, that we can be friends with God. Part of what Christ has come to do is to restore a friendship between us and God. And I've encountered tons of Christians who don't even have that in their vocabulary. Yeah. It's sort of off the radar. Mm -hmm. It's not always intuitive for us as believers to think of friendship with God. You're right. In John 15, Jesus says, I don't, I don't call you servants anymore. I'm calling you friends. That's profound. Mm. St. Thomas Aquinas said that's the goal of the Christian life is friendship with God. And when we think about the nature of friendship, think of friendships where you, you know, you're, you're with friends around a table, a meal, you know, six o'clock for some meal. And next thing you know, it's 1130 and it's like, I, we weren't planning on staying this late. And the only reason anybody's got up from the table is to go to the bathroom or get more dessert. You know, and it, there are these rich things. But what if it were like that with God? Mm. What if we enjoyed his presence? What if there was desire and delight, which are the hallmarks of, you know, again, if we think of the Trinity, John 17 is a good place to see this intimacy of the Trinity, perichoresis, the oneness that comes from the threeness through love, through reciprocity, through back and forth, through giving and receiving, where the Father loves the Son in the Spirit. The Son loves the Father in the Spirit. I am in you, you're in me. What if you can be invited into that kind of love. As Jesus says, as the fathers love me, I love you. You're in me. I'm in the father. The father's in me. I'm in you. We're invited into that nature of relationship with God. We talk freely about glorifying God, but there's a lot of stuff in the New Testament about God glorifying us. That makes us uncomfortable, but right? What if there's a reciprocity, yeah. a back and forthness, just like in John 17 between Jesus and the father, even on giving glory, where there's uh, those who are our friends that we want the best for. We want to see them in glory. We want to see them flourishing. We want to see them magnificent. What if that was the kind of relationship? Like we want that uh, for, for God is to be seen as glorious mm. and magnificent. And he wants that for us mm. creationally. I mean, I just, don't, I think our distance with God, our fear of him, our shame, our difficulty in really trusting the gospel. Boy, if we could think like that, can you imagine? One of the difficulties with Aristotle is that he says there can't be a kind of disparity in mm -hmm. the highest type of relationship, yeah. in the highest type of friendship, mm -hmm. right? So there can't be a kind of inequality. If there is a kind of inequality, then it just is not at that level of the deepest, best sort yeah. of friendship. And so I've thought that poses a problem for being friends with God because there is this inequality. And then a solution, though, that is still still Aristotelian in spirit really is the incarnation, mm, right? Mm -hmm. Because the incarnation is God taking upon human nature, yeah. right? Perfecting, being the perfect human, and then I link my life mm -hmm. with Christ, thereby linking my life with God, thereby, you know, there is exactly what you're saying, right? There is this sort of Christ comes to lift us up so that we can enjoy this kind of, you know, near reciprocity, which is a deep union with God. You're right. Aristotle says there's no way that we could be friends with the gods. They're, we're too different. As you know, and Thomas Aquinas would know, he just does not like to disagree with Aristotle. He just loves Aristotle, but he just disagrees with him there. Yeah. He's like, no, you, you, that's what we're meant for, is friendship with God. Union with Christ is deep. 
in the Reformed tradition. And this, I think, allows us to think about your insight about the Incarnation and a way that we connect with God that is maybe, by analogy, something like Aristotle saying, you know, one soul and two body, that there's something where Christ is in us. Yeah. We're in yeah. him. There is some kind of union with Christ. The way that Jonathan Edwards would put this is that we start to have the same heart in the sense that we love the same things, yeah. delight in the same things, are moved by the same things. There's a union of hearts that is what a friendship looks like. Yeah. Our souls get bigger and they overlap with other souls. Aristotle was wrong. And I think Aquinas and the Reformed tradition are right. That grounds friendship with God. If we would but believe the gospel, that there's not shame that keeps us from him, that we stand in grace and love. You've been listening to The Virtuous Mind, a podcast from Providence Christian College. The mission of Providence Christian College as a reformed Christian institution is to equip students to be firmly grounded in biblical truth, thoroughly educated in the liberal arts, and fully engaged in their church, their community, and the world for the glory of God and for service to humanity. We'd love to have you visit our campus. Providence Christian College is now accepting applications for the upcoming semester contact an admissions counselor to learn more. Visit providencecc.edu.